Coming up next on Passion Struck. Never even thought of doing the marathons, and let alone across the English Channel, not the easiest of marathon swims. And he said, no, you've been through buds. I think you got the right mindset. You should be able to do it. But contact the family of one of your buddies, one of your fallen buddies. And immediately I thought of Neil Fifi, Neil Roberts, his nickname is Fifi. I called Patty, his wife, and I said, hey, Patty, I'm thinking of doing something in memory of Neil. What do you think? And she said, well, what are you thinking of doing? And I told her. I could hear her slap the table on the other end of the phone. She said, oh, my God, you got to do it. He would love that. He would love that. He would have done it with you. And I was like, oh shit. I just screwed myself into this one. I can't get out. Now I'm committed. I just told Patty that I'm gonna do it. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become Passion struck. I am absolutely thrilled and honored to have my very good friend, Captain John Doodle, on the podcast today. Welcome, John. So great for you to finally be here because we've been talking about this for, I think, like a year and a half now. <laughs> John, it's taken forever, man. I mean, we're talking like two and a half years we've been talking about this. I feel blessed to be here finally. So thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, well, thank you for giving me so many of your friends to be on the show. I mean, I appreciate it, <laughs> but I figured... We, yeah, we you had been... Redman on, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, and Mac Belt, he'll be coming on, and a bunch of guys. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you for that. And I think we have so much to explore today because you've had such an incredible life and career. But I want to start where it all began in Walnut Creek, California. Okay. All right. And can you share how your family's emphasis on adventure and stepping out and creating experiences oh, yeah. shaped who yeah. you have become? Well, so I grew up in Northern California, Walnut Creek. It's part of the San Francisco Bay Area. My mom and dad, John and Nora, my sister, Tori, younger sister. And we were swimmers. We did wreck swimming and that kind of stuff. And we were big skiers. My dad was a ski patrol. He Every winter, so about three weekends out of each month, we'd be up in Lake Tahoe, and he was national ski patrol, did that for 30-plus years. He also worked for Southwest Bell, Pacific Telephone, and a bunch of other stuff. But where I really got the taste of adventure in my family was in 1978, AT&T reached out to all the phone companies in the whole nation, and they said, hey, the Shah of Iran in Tehran wants to redo his entire communication infrastructure. And they asked for contractors to come to Tehran, Iran, for three years at a time. So it was in 1978. My dad comes home, tells my mom, hey, what do you think about moving to Tehran? My mom says, no way in hell are we going <laughs> to Iran. <laughs> and then my dad takes his piece of paper and he slides it across the dinner table. And he said, well, this is what they're looking to pay me. And my mom said, well, when are we going? <laughs> so. We ended up going to Tehran. I was eight, nine years old, and that was before the revolution. So the Shah was in power. But while we were there, things started to go south. And I'll tell you what, you want to talk about adventure? That was high adventure. It was crazy. What, getting out of there? Get, yeah, the whole experience. My dad got out before the hostages were taken, but all the women and children had been evacuated by that time. So we were back in California when all that was taking place. Wow. Yeah, that was the beginning of my appetite for adventure. Ended up going through high school, played basketball, got hurt, and I was told I'll, I'd never run again. So I started swimming. And uh, I swam all through high school. Uh, I wasn't great, but I was good enough that I got noticed by some colleges, and I swam uh, for a guy, we'll talk about him later, uh, Mr. Mike Troy. Gold medalist, right? Yep, double gold medalist in the 1960 Olympics, world record holder in the 200 meter fly, and did, I believe it was three tours in Vietnam 
as a SEAL, back when the Navy SEALs were a brand new thing, after the UDTs and post-Kennedy getting the SEAL teams going. And I'll tell you what, Mike used to tell these stories. They were motivating as hell, mm. and they were great learning experiences, but it always resonated with me. That kind of planted the seed for me eventually getting into the teams. Well, you have an interesting route of getting there. Yes, and I do. When you and I, you went to the Air Force Academy, I went to the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. and ironically, my roommate went in the Air Force, you go in the Navy, so I guess we, we traded one. Who's your roommate? Colin Morrison. Oh, okay. Don't know him. Yeah, and also another one of my company mates, Todd Siobhan, also went into the Air Force. Okay. One got out as a colonel, one got out after five years. You were in 91 year group, right? 93. 93. Okay, I knew we were separated by one. So I was in 92 year group, so let's back up a little bit. So oh. you're 90. So we're about the same age. So you remember when Top Gun came out? The first. Well, that's one, what I was going to say. Old one? That's what I was going to say. Everyone I knew went to the academy because they wanted to be Top Gun. I wanted. To, I was too tall to be to Maverick. I wanted to be Goose, but not get killed. Right. <laughs> but I, I wanted to be Goose. I applied to the Naval Academy. I got turned down. They actually laughed at me on the phone when I told them my SAT scores, my college entrance exam scores. Uh, they basically laughed at me, and uh, I told Mike Troy, who is one of my mentors, or behind my dad, Mike, and we'll come back to him several times, just an incredible mentor, and I always tell people, if you don't have a mentor in your life that's not friend or family, it's incredibly important, I think, to have a back backboard that you can lean against when things get tough, but uh, anyway, yeah, I went, uh, lost my train of thought. Well, I wanted to do the same thing you wanted to do, but there was no way in heck I wanted to be Goose. Oh, yeah. If I was going to have to land on an aircraft carrier, I wanted my hands on the stick. And unfortunately, <laughs> I have some field of vision issues. And okay. I, like my junior year, even beginning of uh, my first year as we were preparing to do selection, mm -hmm. I would go to the optometrist like every week and they were so patient with me because if you had on the 2020 I was able to get four out of six and then one time I got five out of six and you had to get six out of six and do it like a couple repetitive times and I kept getting five they would bring me in and I could just never get the sixth and so when I knew I couldn't fly uh, in the front seat mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to fly mm -hmm. so then decided I wanted to follow in my father's footstep, who was UDT class of 16, and then I played rugby and I ended up getting hurt and got medically disqualified from being able to do it. So my path was a little bit different, but to go f from the Air Force Academy to the Navy, when I was there, I thought that you had to have lineage, like both the, the gentlemen I knew, both their fathers were in the Air Force, mm -hmm. so I had always had the conclusion that you had to have a father or grandfather who had served in another service, but you, you proved me totally wrong. Well, I mean, my dad was Air Force. He did a career in the Air Force. He, uh, during Vietnam, he did four or five years active duty. Then he got out, and ironically, he missed the camaraderie that comes with being in an organization like the military. So he tried to get back in, mm. and he kept getting denied, 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 because they were downsizing as Vietnam right. was ending, obviously. And eventually they let him in to the reserves. And so when I got turned down at the Naval Academy, I asked Mike what he thought, and he said, well, you should talk to the swim coach at Navy. That also went down in flames. But then he said, hey, if you want to fly, look at the Air Force Academy. And I did, and I called the uh, coach there, and ironically, they needed a short distance butterflyer and breaststroker. <laughs> they looked at me, my school grades and my scores, and I said, well, keep taking that test, and if you can scratch the bare bone minimum, we can probably get you in. And that's what happened. So I barely got in. Wow, so you end up graduating from the Air Force Academy. It must have been pretty interesting when you're there in a Navy uniform when you're graduating. I assume that's how you did it because yeah, yeah, I mean, because that's what our guys did. I mean, they were there in their Air Force. Yeah, it was a little different there. We You, you get in your parade uniform and you have the, the big parade where everybody throws their hats in the air and that kind of stuff. But you get commissioned right before that. 
So I put on navy whites with Air Force shoulder boards. I got commissioned, became an ensign, 01 ensign, and then I had to change back into the parade uniform and then go march out for the graduations. May 27th, 1992, Ensign Doolittle graduated with all his Zoomy buddies. And, uh, but there were actually four of us in that class that went into the Navy. Two of us went, we all wanted to go to BUDS. We all wanted to go to basic underwater demolition school and uh, initially had orders to do that. But the Navy, once they realized there were four Air Force guys going to one BUDS class, they said, no way. And uh, they only ended up taking two. And I was not one of the two. For the next three years, every six months, I submitted a package to try and change my designator to go into the BUDS training pipeline. And I got denied six times over and, three years. Yeah. And while you were doing those applications, you were a Navy diver. I was if a hard hat diver, salvage diver. Yeah, that's what I was doing in the Navy. So do you think that ended up helping prepare you even more to then oh, yeah. going to BUDS? Oh yeah, absolutely. The Navy uh, dive school for the salvage diver is, it's different than anything you do in, in uh, the SEAL teams, but it definitely prepares you for being comfortable in the water. If, if, there's one thing, if there's one thing you need to be comfortable at to go into teams, you gotta be comfortable in the water. So that, yeah, absolutely, the hard hat diving school helped with that. Yeah, and I think one of the misconceptions about the SEALs is that when you're diving, I think some people think that you're going really far under and, and yeah. really a lot of what you're doing is like right under the yeah. surface. So. Oxygen rebreathers, you yeah. stay like 15, 20 feet under the surface and you transit, you know combat swimmer is getting from point A to point B. It's not about going down. So I always love to hear about different experiences from BUDS. And a friend of mine, one of my classmates, Chris Cassidy, told me the story that when Chris. he was going through BUDS, he and his guys were told to clean the office of some of the instructors. And this was <laughs> right before Hell Week started. And he said, we go into this office and with all of us who, who go in to clean it, it probably only takes us about a half an hour, but they allocated like three, four hours for it. And he goes, when we walk in, just like this book is sitting, here's a book that says Hell Week Schedule. And some of the guys who are with them said, oh my God, there's the book, it's right there. And Chris is like, no, you don't wanna pick that up. There's something to this, this is a trap. <laughs> but the two people pick it up, they end up photocopying it and they spend the whole night reading it, going through it, and before Hell Week even started, both of them quit. And Chris said the lesson that he really learned from that is mm. that sometimes it's better not to know the hardships that you're gonna face than to have them laid out right there in front of you because that's what they psych themselves out. I uh, agree with that, I agree. And I think that applies to a lot of life approaching difficult times one step at a time in bud in hell weeks they say don't think of it as a day at a time or even an evolution at a time and an evolution might last one to three hours but to think of it as one step at a time if you can make it to right there well you can probably make that next step and to just think about those really difficult times in life when things get tough just one, you know, what they say, how do, how do you eat an elephant? One, one bite at a time. Not thinking about the whole overarching picture, yeah, because it can get overwhelming. I mean, we've talked about this right. in the past, yeah. Well, in the teams, you served in an actual, you were in SEAL Team 2, mm -hmm. and you did deployments. You also served at much higher levels. One of the things I like to talk about in my book is this concept called Gardner Leadership. And mm. the person who really taught me this was General Stan McChrystal. And what Stan talks about, and I think it's very applicable to a SEAL team, is that from his perspective, he could be the head of SOCOM or whatever detachment is giving you your mission. But if you are a SEAL and you're deployed 5,000 miles away from where your boss is, Mm -hmm. Your boss has got to think of it that they're giving you the training, they're giving you the operational awareness of what you need to do on this mission, but yet they have to be hands off because they can't be there in the moment that you're in conflict to micromanage everything you're doing. Yeah. Do you think that's true and how do you apply that to the civilian world? Or Yeah, in my current role, I love talking about commander's intent 
and that's something we learned about in the team. It's a military concept, but it's very much leveraged in Special Operations Command, where you take a very senior person in an organization, and you talk to the most junior person in an organization, the whole organization, about what the overall intent is of what we're trying to achieve. And you tell them what you want done, but not how to get it done. You gotta rely on historical perspective and their experience to really accomplish whatever that mission is. There's a great quote, his name's Ritz Slabinski, SLAB, Medal of Honor uh, recipient. He would be a great guy to have on your show as well. But SLAB used to say all the time, you're never too junior to have the best idea in the room and you're never too senior to be wrong. You're never too junior to have the best idea in the room. You're never too senior to be wrong. And that's beautiful because it empowers everyone in an organization to achieve something great. And when you look at, and yeah, okay, I was in the SEAL teams. I did that for 25 years. But when you look at any small group of like-minded personalities and like-minded people trying to achieve some overarching goal in state, if you can tell them not at all how you want it done, but tell them what the end state is and let them navigate in the, between those swim lanes, it's amazing what they'll come up with. And oftentimes, when you empower those junior guys in an organization, they'll crush it. Yeah. They'll crush it. When they feel like they're being under that traditional military model, that hierarchical where, hey, you will do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it, that doesn't work a lot of the times. That's certainly the case in special operations. It's funny, Rear Admiral Mentz. I do, yes. And I was talking to him ab about you, and <laughs> he goes, when people see Doolittle, he goes, that's what everyone pictures a, a SEAL looking like. He goes, when they see me, he goes, I have no physical ability at all. So he goes, John makes it look easy. And he goes, I had to work like 10 times harder than he did to do anything. Oh, man. <laughs> but He's a great American, great leader. He uh, did a friend of mine's retirement just a couple weeks ago. Oh, that's great. Well, yeah. well, when I think of SEALs, and I think when a lot of people do, you oftentimes think of physical endurance and the physical aspects of it. But I think way beyond that is the mental toughness aspect of it. Can you share a technique or a practice that you learned in the teams that helped you maintain mental resilience in times of extreme challenge? Uh, yeah, before you go to initial training, everything in a young alpha male's head is all about physical. And uh, once you get there and you realize everybody's just in incredible shape, and I don't wanna say everybody's the same, but in my opinion, the thing that distinguishes guys that leave on their own accord, that ring the bell and quit, and the people that stay, it's their mindset. It is absolutely mm -hmm. their mindset. For me, personally, it was that perspective that I might get kicked out, I might get medically dropped if I get injured, or something horrible might happen, but I will not, no matter what, quit. And that's where my mind was. Now, everybody treats it a little bit different, but it is definitely more mental than physical. And when you go through and experience that live with a lot of uh, friends and teammates, you walk away from that experience, at least I did, realizing that there's really nothing you can't do as long as you surround yourself with the right people. What you learn at BUDS, though, is you cannot do it by yourself. Absolutely not. Impossible. No, no absolutely not. Really a band of brothers, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, a lot of SEAL missions are shrouded in secrecy. As they should be. As they should be. <laughs> and you're going into very dangerous, oftentimes unknown mm -hmm. situations. Can you describe at all what goes on behind the background, like when you're typically preparing for a mission, what aspects do you focus on that people might not expect? 
Well, and this can apply to a lot of things in life. The mission planning, that was one of the things that kind of surprised me, was how distributed across the organization it was. I mean, you might be the senior enlisted in a task unit, you might be the senior officer in a task unit, but you're not necessarily doing any more work than anyone else in that task unit. Everybody's working hard to prepare for what that mission is. So if you think about a, a small program manager in a small team, if you wanted to take the special operations model and apply it to that team, you give everybody high levels of responsibility, even those most junior guys. And uh, that surprised me. I really thought the officers and the senior enlisted kind of shaped all the mission planning. And that's not at all the case. That's not how it works. Without giving away too much, the way we insert an infill to a target, that might be all the point man's responsibility to figure all that out. And unless one of the leadership in the organization sees a major issue with it, they go with it. They trust him. And that has applications throughout life, especially if you're working in the business world, right? Right. I mean... We, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. My father was a preacher. Really? So, yeah. And I always asked him, especially because he was in Cambodia, and I'm like, how did you feel about being in that position? He goes, I didn't think about it. He goes, you don't think about it. You've got right. a job you're trained to do. If you don't do it well, that people are going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. They're relying on you. And so he goes, I just went into it trying to do the best job I possibly could. And yeah. I just felt the rest of it would take care of itself because everyone else was entrusting me that I'm going to get it right so that they could concentrate on their jobs. And I, I Is he still around? He is. He's 86 now. Awesome. Awesome. I should get your dad and my dad. <laughs> you all have a beer. That'd be great. <laughs> so I want to now jump from the SEALs to your swimming prowess because you not only swam in college and ironically my roommate in college was also a swimmer. He was a butterflyer. Okay. But you did something pretty remarkable. As far as I know, you are the only Navy SEAL who's ever swum the English Channel. Is that <laughs> accurate? I think there's another guy that's done it now. That's done it now. But at the time, you were the only one. And that's, what, 33 kilometers, something like that? Uh, it's 21 miles as the crow flies, but what happens with the channel is you go through two tidal shifts. So your track across the channel ends up looking like a big S. So 21 miles as the crow flies, but our track for my swim was 37.1 miles. But uh, you're not swimming that far because if you're swimming one knot this way and the current's going five knots this way, you, you understand? You, yeah. You're being pushed and pulled by the current tides and currents, so you really rely on your pilot vessel. And that was an incredible experience. I was at the school, Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. It was early 2004. A lot of my friends and teammates were over in uh, Afghanistan, and at that point, Iraq. So we had both things going on then, and it was a really, busy time in the military for sure but I was struggling with that because all my buddies are getting after it doing these great things and I'm at school at a post grade when you're an officer they encourage you to go get your post grad right. degree that whole thing and I one night I called up Mike Troy again and I said hey Mike the school thing it really sucks and I'm struggling with it and something's not right with me I just I feel off and without skipping a beat, man, he's no longer with us, but I know he's laughing right now. Without skipping a beat, he goes, John, swim the English Channel and do it for one of your buddies that died. And I was like, Mike, I was like a 200 meter breaststroker when you were my coach. I've never done a marathon swim. I've never even thought of doing the marathon swim, let alone across the English Channel, not the easiest of marathon swims. And he said, no. You've been through buds. I think you got the right mindset. You should be able to do it. But contact the family of one of your buddies, one of your fallen buddies. And so immediately I thought of Neil Fifi, Neil Roberts. His nickname was Fifi. And so I called Patty, his wife, and I said, Hey, Patty, I'm thinking of doing something in memory 
of Neil, what do you think? And she said, well, what are you thinking of doing? And I told her, and she just, I could hear her slap the table on the other end of the phone. She said, oh my God, you gotta do it. <laughs> he would love that. He would love that. He would have done it with you. And I was like, oh shit, I just screwed myself into this one. I can't get out. Now I'm committed. I just told Patty that I'm gonna do it. So then I went to go do my first swim in Monterey no wetsuit, because to do the channel, you for it to count with the Channel Swimming Association, you can't wear any neoprene. So you gotta be in a Speedo, and you can have a swim cap, and you can have earplugs. That's it. No fins, no. Oh no, God, no, no fins. The only rule is you can't touch the boat, and you can't be wearing any neoprene stuff. You can put some like Vaseline on or something under your armpits. But, so I go in Monterey, and I get in the water, to do my first training swim for the English Channel. How long do you think I lasted? Maybe you did a mile? Five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes. At five minutes, I was jackhammering. Because you were so cold. And the water temp in Monterey, that time of year, 58, 59 degrees. But that's the same temperature it is in the summer over in Dover, England. So I was like, ooh, man. But what I learned about myself and about human physiology is your body has an amazing ability to adapt. And so the first day I lasted five minutes, the next day I lasted seven. And by the end of the week, I was in the water for 10 minutes, the next week, 15 minutes. And later on, a few months later, call, I wanna say it was about six months of doing that, or a little more, I worked my way up to what they call an immersion swim up in San Francisco. You gotta last for 10 hours, in water under 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So I uh, did that, and a long story longer, did it in memory of Neil, and to raise money for the UDT SEAL Association and the Navy SEAL Foundation to help Gold Star wow. families. And uh, yeah, long story longer, <laughs> eventually made it. Oh, how long uh, did it end up taking you to do the swim? 12 and a half hours, a little under 12, that's 12 hours, 24. Man, and when you finish that, you go to Dover, you go, so you swim Dover to Calais or near Calais, France, and then you finish it and you get back on the boat and the boat brings you back to Dover and you go to the White Horse Pub. <laughs> and the White Horse Pub, if you complete the swim, you get a free pint of Guinness. Oh, that's your reward. That's your reward. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to write your name on the ceiling tiles or on the walls. And, but I, there's a pay phone, right, or there was, and I went out there, called Patty, and uh, oof, it was powerful. It was one of the coolest things I've ever done. Man, it, it, I mean, it's an amazing thing to say you've done it, but to do it in honor of, of a teammate is quite uh, a remarkable honor for him and his family. One of the things Mike told me before I started training for this, he said, yeah, John, it's hard. It's going to be hard. It's going to be one of the hardest things you've ever done. But if you're doing it for a purpose greater than yourself, you will be able to achieve it. If you do something for a greater good or a greater purpose than just this, then you'd be able to accomplish it. And he was exactly right because we were halfway across and the tides were going, the currents are going one way, the winds had picked up and we're going the other way. So now, we didn't have swells, we had that washing machine chop and everything was starting to fall apart. My stroke count was slowing down, which you never want to have happen. My shoulder was just aching, I was cramping, I was hitting jellyfish, all this stuff. And my dad was in the support crew on the pilot boat and they all could see that I was struggling. And I didn't know it, but they had snuck on board a, a three by five American flag and it was like 15, 18 knots of wind, and I breathe to my right, and I look up, and they're holding in the wind this American flag. And I just remember thinking, holy smokes, John, get out of your own head. This isn't about you, man. It's about Neil. It's about all the guys like Neil that we're gonna lose going forward in this long war. And I'll tell you, it was like a light switch. All of a sudden, nothing hurt anymore and we were able to finish it. What's incredible and I just released an episode this week that wow. we're doing this with yes. this Gurkha soldier named Harry 
Buddha Magar. The guy from Nepal. Yes, and yeah. this gentleman unfortunately lost both his legs above the knee from an IED yep. in Afghanistan, and remarkably, he was the first person with that situation who's ever climbed Everest. And just to hear his whole story, he got, similar to you trying to get in the seals, he kept getting denied because the, the Nepali government doesn't want a fatality. They don't want someone to fail. Sure. And so he had to actually climb Mount Blanc and another mountain just to prove to him that, yeah. that he could do it. But I, wow. as I was interviewing him, I said, how often did you want to give up? He said, almost every hour of every single day. He goes, because it was so hard. He goes, but to your point, he goes, I wasn't doing it for myself. I was doing it to prove to other people with disabilities Ugh. so they could see me and realize in their own mind that anything is possible if they set their mind to it. I was telling Katie about, I listened to the first 10 minutes of it last night when you told me. And so I haven't finished it yet, but when I told Katie, bilateral amputee, both above the knee, first person in history to summit on Mount Everest. She didn't believe me at first. We had to look it up. She's, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I'm really grateful you are able to get him on the show. That's an amazing story. Well, I happened to, I don't know where I heard about him. I think it might have been Corey saw a video about it and said, you gotta get this guy on the show. Yeah. And I'd never, it was such a remarkable accomplishment. I just thought his story was worth telling to inspire other people. Going back to swimming, English Channel isn't the only We're thing. We're staying in swimming. Though. We're staying in swimming. <laughs> okay. English Channel isn't the only thing that you have done that is supporting the Navy SEAL Foundation and Fallen Seals. I have seen you now two years in a row swim here in Tampa Bay in January. You do the Frogman Swim. And that is something that's in what it's like 14th year. Yep. Well, 15 years. We just had our uh, 15th one, and so let's go back a little bit. 15 years ago, I was stationed at Special Operations Command Headquarters, SOCOM headquarters, and we heard about a SEAL, and he doesn't mind me telling the story, so I'll t tell you his name, Dan Kanasen. And Dan in Afghanistan. They were landing on a hilltop. They were inserting from a rotary wing insertion. And the point man missed a pressure plate IED, improvised explosive device. And Dan stepped on it. And the IED went low order, meaning the whole daisy chain of explosives did not go off, luckily, thank God. But the pressure plate primer charge did go off, blew both Dan's legs off above the knees. And so we heard about that, of course, immediately at SOCOM and they medevaced him and he was at Walter Reed. And, and we were hearing through the grapevine that this was before our foundations had a lot of money to help wounded guys, to help Gold Star families and all that. So we heard his family was in the Hurt Locker financially a little bit. And so some of us here locally and a lot of these guys, Dan O'Shea was one of them, and uh, a lot of us got together and we said, well, what can we do to, to support this guy? And somebody, I think it might have been Rory, came up with, why don't, oh, I know who, it was uh, Terry Tomlin. Rest in peace, Terry. That guy was great. But uh, Terry said, let's swim across the bay. And I was like, wait a minute, the Tampa Bay is like 26 miles across. What are you talking about? No, no, we'll do a shorter version. Eh, 5K, three and a half mile-ish. There's a place we can swim across. And so we did it. We ended up having a little party afterwards at the, the American Legion on the Tampa side. Uh, there were about, I don't know, 25 of us, maybe 30 tops that showed up that morning. It was cold. It was in the 30s. And at the end... We consolidated all these handwritten IOU notes on bar napkins, little wads of cash, pocket lint, checks, and we put them all on a table at the American Legion. And we started counting up. And we were hoping to make about $3,000 to give Dan's right. family to just help out with something, anything. And it ended up being about $30,000. And at that point, we're like, well, wait a minute. We're onto something here. Because we didn't even try and we made $30,000 for this guy. And so now jump forward a few years 
and instead of doing the swim for an individual, we decided to do it in support of the Navy SEAL Foundation to help with Gold Star families and surviving spouses and surviving kids that are struggling with A, B, or C. And each year, the swim has made more and more money for the foundation. And the foundation's got a lot of money to help guys now. But if you think about what happens when we lose somebody, when a family loses their husband or their father, the entire family needs to get to the memorial service. The entire family needs hotel rooms. There's rental cars, there's per diem costs. Then there's the burial, which is often at a different time. All the travel costs right. that comes with that. And the kids, their college education, the, the SEAL Foundation covers that. A lot of times the spouse had not been working, just been raising a family, but now the spouse needs to go back to work. The foundation helps with that. And it just spider webs in so many ways that they can help these families. That's why we do the swim, and it's incredibly successful. It's one of the, my favorite things to be part of, man. It's really cool. Well, this year when I was there, it was a tough year because right at the time that this was happening, yeah. there were two SEALs in the Gulf who had gone missing, yeah. presumed fatalities. But I also, every single year, you swim for a different uh, family, and it's typically a family who is there present, and this year, I got to see and meet the parents of... Scotty Wirtz is, uh, yeah, mom, his Sandy M Mom was, and, was and there, his yeah. father, yeah. And his father was a fighter pilot himself. And I didn't know that. Yeah, he flew F-4s. I mean, just to see how impactful it was for them and the power of hope and remembrance that it brought them made me, I mean, just internalize the whole reason why everyone does it. And I think what's remarkable now is that the vast majority of people who swim it aren't Navy SEALs, they're civilians who are now yeah. trying to help, or it, veterans. It is such a cool way for the Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater region community to come together to support this effort. Because at that memorial ceremony, when the sun's coming up that morning and the reading of the names of all the Naval Special Warfare operators we've lost since 9-11, when that memorial service is happening, we're surrounded by the local community on the beach. And it is incredible. I mean, you've experienced it. I, I, every time I talk to somebody about this, I encourage them, even if they don't volunteer, even if they don't swim, even if they don't go to the after party, go see the memorial ceremony and the reading of the names. It's so powerful and it's just information that needs to be shared. And I'll keep doing this thing till I, I can't walk anymore. Hell, I'll keep doing it after I can't walk. <laughs> Where are we going now? The life of a SEAL, I, I think <laughs> any of us who served, we end up later on having a whole bunch of injuries. And if I yeah. have it right, you've had a dozen plus surgeries 13. yourself. Yeah, 13 orthopedic surgeries. You're stationed at SOCOM, uh, which is the Special Operation Command here in McDill. And at the time, you are now having to get shoulder surgery, if I have it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you had had to have this shoulder surgery, yeah, rotator yeah, cuff in the past, yep. and and it took you about a year to recover from it the first time. But you're going through this now, the second time, and you're introduced to this device. Yeah, by a I know where you're going now. Yes, and so you're at the same time you're contemplating getting out of the service, but I knowing you you want to do something that's going to help people. And so yep. you end up starting to use this device, which we're going to talk about, and it ends up cutting your recovery time in about half, if I understand it yep. correctly. You got it right. And it's like you've done research on that. <laughs> and you start realizing that this thing has got applications that be helping a lot of people, especially yeah. people who've lost limbs, who are in severe chronic pain, mm -hmm. like a, vet, a lot of veterans are, are in, and even uh, the elderly who suffer falls and other things. So can you tell us about this path? I, th I think I just did some sugar coating on it, but. Well, first of all, thanks for even going down this road because I've been out for six and a half years and I've been working with this company, Katsu, the whole time. Katsu is a Japanese word. It stands for increase, ka, and if you think a shiatsu, atsu, pressure. Increase pressure, ka, atsu. And there's another word, Shiatsu, shiatsu. So katsu is like pressure on, shiatsu is pressure off, jiatsu. 
What Katsu is, it's pneumatic, elastic pneumatic bands controlled by a little pneumatic compressor. And when I was going through rehab over at SOCOM from one of my surgeries, they would put these devices, in this case on my arms, and during the inflation phase, it looks like a tourniquet, but it's not a tourniquet. It's an elastic pneumatic band. And all it does is it pools the blood in the limb. So if I had it on my legs right now, during the pressure phase, I would feel all this tingling in my legs. With it would all be engorged with blood, and you're slowing down that venous return. But when you start moving the leg, when it's in that state, or same with your arms, it f not only does it feel much harder than it actually is, but you're tricking the body you're tricking the biomechanics in the body. It's almost a, like a, a biohack where the body thinks you're working really hard, but all you're really doing is instead of moving 100 pounds, you might be moving five pounds, right. but you're getting that hormonal response as if you're moving 100 pounds. So it's a great tool for rehab. That's how I got introduced to it. They'd have me do these exercises with incredibly low resistance, low weight, but it was really difficult. And what I found is, in my case, they used it on me for two different surgeries. In both cases, my rehab time was pretty, pretty quick. Wow. And uh, yeah, I fell in love with it. And a few years later, I was getting out. I ended up traveling to Tokyo, Japan, and I met the founder, Dr. Yoshiaki Sato. And I got trained by him. And then I met the CEO for Katsu Global. And long story longer, I've been working there ever since. But the, the thing I really enjoy about it is helping, and you touched on it, is helping the wounded, ill, injured teammates, especially in the veteran space. There, there's something to be said when somebody has chronic injuries, orthopedic injuries or otherwise, or they have a lot of osteoarthritis and they can't like go to the gym and lift heavy anymore because they get that massive inflammation response or they get injured and then they're down for a while. Yeah. This is a way to, with very low weight, so the risk of injury is very low, but this is a way to get that workout without going heavy. And if you saw pictures of my back, you'd understand why I will never be able to go heavy ever again but I can still get good workouts from this stuff. I want to explore this a little bit more. I mean, yeah, we are an alternative health podcast, so yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this fits right in. And I know you've got one of these with you. So my understanding of this, if I have it correctly, is the person who discovered this actually studied people over a 10-year period mm -hmm. to understand the usefulness of it. And I think I've heard you talk that there are people up until 104 years old who mm -hmm. have used this in a safe manner. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I understand about this is it's got a couple different modes. One, as I understand it, is it's like a constant mode. Mm -hmm. And another one is recircling mode where it gives we, you we some- We call it the, the Katsu cycle mode. Okay, so, so why don't you go yeah. through this? Well, first of all, sarcopenia is the muscle loss that happens after, as you get older and older, you lose more and more muscle mass. And it used to be considered a medical truth that once you got over 55 years old, you were gonna start losing muscle mass. What Dr. Sato showed, and he showed it with people up to 104 years old with MRI cross-sectional measurements and whatnot, if you pool the blood in a limb and then you exercise that limb, very simple exercises, uh, you can actually get muscle hypertrophy even into your 80s, 90s, and in that extreme case, 104 years old. That has taken a lot of the fitness industry and turned it on its head a little bit, mm -hmm. especially for people that are in their like 50s and older. Because when you talk to guys, especially, we see this as ex-military guys all the time, guys just don't want to go to the gym and go heavy anymore because if I go to the gym and I do some deadlifts, just like back in the day, 225 deadlift was nothing. If I do a 135 deadlift and I'm wrong in my form in any way, I'm down for a month, if not longer. This is a way 
where you can still get that, but maybe just do the bar or maybe no bar at all and just do those movements. And this is what it looks like. It's, this is our Bluetooth version where the compressor's actually connected to the band. But these bands, they're not tourniquets. They stretch and they give and they move with the limb. Now, there's a lot of, I'll call them competitor products, and they use repurposed surgical tourniquets. And that would be a much wider than this, over double the width of this, and they're rigid and they're cuffs. Now, and those are designed to fully occlude blood flow, and then you back it off a little bit, and you can get muscle hypertrophy from that. That's true, but you can only do that on young, healthy people. You would never do that on somebody that has compromised vascular system or cardiac issues. This, on the other hand, is actually a cardiac rehab device in Tokyo. We just oh, recently uh, registered it as a class one medical device here in the U.S., and we're working with the VA and a lot of medical organizations for the cardiac rehab piece of this. And for those who are not watching but are listening, ah, th this point. is, it's good about point. what, 18 inches long? Uh, yeah, give so, or take. Yeah, so this is an armband. It's about 18 inches long, just over an inch wide. It has a pneumatic bladder in it. This one is controlled by your smartphone, so it has the actual compressor on here. The other versions, uh, you wear the compression device on your shorts or on your sweats, and then there's a tube that connects to the band. A lot of the military organizations like that one better because you can untether. The band will hold the pressure when it's untethered, and then you're waterproof in that mode, and you right. can do aggressive movements like jiu-jitsu and things like that. I like this version when I'm like in the kitchen making coffee and working around the house. But that folds into something else that is really what got me started with this company. It's less about having people add something new. It's more about taking whatever your life, how you live your life already activity-wise and folding this into your existing life. If somebody never goes to the gym, they should never go to the gym with this. They just fold this in to what they already do for activity anyway. I could talk about this all day long. <laughs> so going back to Harry Buddha Magar, I know one uh, of the things that uh, those who have lost limbs, mm -hmm. it could be from diabetes, it could be from a motorcycle accident, it could be from combat, they end up getting phantom pain mm -hmm. where they almost feel like their limb mm -hmm. is still there. How would this help someone in that situation? So we have uh, many cases of this decreasing residual limb pain. Now, full disclosure, when I say residual limb pain, I'm talking more at the actual area where the limb had been severed and then sewn closed. Okay. So those nerve endings around, uh, I don't like to call it a, a stump, but that residual limb ending a lot of people have pain at that point. This helps alleviate that pain by simulating, when you exercise, what you do, you're dilating and relaxing blood vessels over and over when you're exercising. Well, you can do that with this in the passive state. So if you think about an amputee and they have a lot of discomfort in that limb, if they can exercise that residual limb, then it feels much better nine times out of ten. Some guys don't like it. I mean, I'll be honest. Some guys, especially if they've had any nerve ablation done, this can actually not work on many of those guys. But nine times out of ten, guys love it. Now, we also have had people with what you're talking about, phantom limb pain, having that decrease with this. But we haven't done studies on that. I can't say that we, we got to do some further research on that. But anecdotally, yes. I think what it is more than anything is a distraction technique for the brain. I think the brain gets into these pain pathways, gets so engrossed or embedded in the brain. If you can distract those pain pathways, then you can help decrease that pain. Paraplegics and quadriplegics that are dealing with not nerve. Uh, what type of nerve pain is that called? I, uh, I can't remember off the top. I'm, I'm having a mind blank, but we work with plenty of uh, paralyzed veterans and otherwise, and it's a way to improve systemic circulation in that person. And we have somebody right here in Tampa 
He's a total quad. He was shot through and through as C3, so he's a complete quadriplegic from his neck down, but neuropathic pain. So his neuropathic pain, even though he has no feeling or traditional feeling and no muscular control over his legs, he's still before bed, he still has neuropathic pain. This seems to decrease it in those guys. I'm not gonna say it makes it go away, but he does say when he's using this before bed, he's able to come off those meds to help put him to sleep. Okay, well, I mean, that's great. And I think the other big use case is, I know when my grandparents were older, my parents now, we're always worried about them falling mm. because you slip on ice or slip anyway, you end up damaging a hip or something like that it's the repercussions that come from that downstream. And to me, this is a great way for people to use a device like this without having to go to the gym if that's not a resource or they don't have the strength at that point to do it. Yeah, frailty is a big issue. As people get into their 70s and 80s, I mean, both my parents use this on a religious basis every single day, and they swear by it. And if you saw my mom and dad, I mean, yes, they look like, sorry, mom, you don't look like you're in your 80s. You look like you're in your 60s. But their muscle tone, they both still ski. They both still hike. It's that eliminating frailty as you age is incredibly powerful. And to your point, that is a way, if you do fall, if you do slip and fall, muscle tone in the body is just going to help in a variety of ways with that fall, if not help keep you from even falling in the first place. And I think going back to that story with Harry and him trying to show that anything's possible, I think your journey of doing the English Channel and even becoming a SEAL is also a testament that if you put your mind to something and you have passion and perseverance and you're intentional about how you're approaching it, you can accomplish things that you never in your life thought you could accomplish. Yeah. Is there something you would like to talk to the audience about that? Yeah, just that my website says anything is achievable. And I think that applies to about anything in life. Anything you put your mind to, especially if you surround yourself with a small team of like-minded individuals, there's nothing that will stop you. And I love talking with people about that. The final thing I wanted to ask you is looking ahead, what are some of the next challenges or goals that you're passionate about pursuing? And if there's one you want to talk about, how are you thinking about tackling it? I love talking with people about the work they do and the passions they have in life. And if you can have both of those intersect some way, you have found personal gold. And that's what I'm doing with Katsu. So my passion journey and my hope for the future is that injured, wounded, first responders, military veterans, especially that population in our country that's dealing with stress and burnout and mental health and behavioral health issues, if you can get them exercising again, or you can get them feeling better about themselves, that's gold. And I'm so grateful that the organization that I'm working with is doing exactly that. My goal is anybody that's wounded, ill, injured, or can't go to the gym because they can't lift heavy weights anymore, I want to get them caught to. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Well, John, if someone is interested in learning more about you, wanting to hear where you're speaking, wants to hire you to speak, things like that, where's the best place for them to go? JohnDoolittle.com. And a friend of mine told me about making a website with my name in it, so that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so John, the backstory of this is John's talking to me about, I need, I'm in the process of designing this website. This is the name I'm going for. <laughs> I've bought the domains for my kids because I right, think if right. you can find them, you should get them because you, they're so valuable. Idea. Because no matter who you are, it's never too late to brand yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'm going through that, and I called John up. I'm like, why aren't you just using your own name? He goes, well, I checked it like six months ago, and it wasn't available. I'm like, 
well, you better go right now because you can buy it for nine ninety nine. <laughs> and and I, I guess she listened to me because you have it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, John, it was such an honor to finally get you on the show, and we just packed a little bit of about who you are, but what a remarkable story, and thank you so much. As I've gotten to know you, you are an inspiration to so many, and I think what I've always admired is you go out of the way, you go out of your way to make other people feel special and to try to help people, and I think that's why you have developed such a big following. Well, thanks, John, and thank you for what you've done with this passion project and this podcast because you're changing a lot of lives in a positive way and that's gold and while we can't sit here and say that you're saving lives I will tell you that I think that is happening so thank you very much for what you're doing well I mean thank you that means a lot and I am just so happy we could finally bring this to the world and hopefully awesome I can uh, get you to do more podcasts with me because I think people would love hearing you and I banter and talk to guests. Let's so, do it. Anytime uh, you want. <laughs> you live right down the street. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you audience for tuning in today and so glad we could get this final episode with John out to you. So thank you again, John. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me, man. man. I am so honored that we were able to do that interview with my friend, Captain John Doolittle, and he and I have honestly been talking about this for the past two years. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Stark podcast interview that I did with Gabby Bernstein, who will share the transformative wisdom from her latest book, Happy Days. We discuss how to heal from your past, embrace the power of self-love, and learn how to step into a life of joy and peace. So tune in and get ready to unlock your happiest days yet. We cannot heal what we're not willing to see. Having the bravery and the courage to become conscious and aware of the physical experiences, the thoughts, the energy, the sensations that are keeping us out of alignment with true nature, which is joy. Having the courage to be the witness of those experiences that are blocking us is the first step to healing because you cannot heal what you're not willing to see. So having the bravery to begin to look at your life and maybe even simply say, is this it? There has to be a better way. That willingness opens the door for more recovery to be revealed. Remember, we rise by lifting others, so share this show with those that you love and care about. And in the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. Until next time, go out there and become passion struck. Mm -hmm.